welcome again to The Empowering Neurologist. I am Dr. David Perlmutter. You know, one of the hot topics on our program seems to be uh, longevity and uh, looking at various technologies that can be implemented to help us with our aging process, something that we all do. And, you know, certainly the discussion um, always tends to revolve around lifestyle changes and how they may be effective. Might there be some kind of interesting uh, molecule that we could add to our regimen that might help us extend at least our health span, if not our, our lifespan? One of the topics people tend to talk about are the length of our telomeres, and we're going to explore that today. There's a wonderful book that we'll talk about today called The Telomere Effect, uh, written by Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, for whom the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded, to whom the Nobel Prize was awarded, as well as Alyssa Eppel, who will be our guest today. Let me tell you about Dr. Eppel. She is a professor and vice chair in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research aims to elucidate the mechanisms of healthy aging and to apply the basic science to scalable interventions that can reach vulnerable populations. She studies psychological, social, and behavioral pathways, uh, underlying chronic psychological stress, and the topic of stress resilience, as well as how these impact cellular aging. She studies the interconnections between stress, addiction, uh, eating, and metabolic health. And with her collaborators, she is conducting various clinical trials to examine the effect of self-regulation and mindfulness training techniques on cellular aging, weight, diet, and even the control of our blood glucose. She studied psychology and psychobiology at Stanford University, where she received her BA and clinical health psychology at Yale University, where she received her PhD. She's received several awards, including the APA Early Career Award, the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research, Neil Miller Young Investigator Award, and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Her research has been folk, uh, reviewed on uh, such uh, events as TED Med, NBC Today Show, CBS's Morning Show, 60 Minutes, National Public Radio, The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and in many uh, scientific documentaries. She has, as I mentioned, co-authored the uh, telomere effect along with uh, Nobel Prize winner Elizabeth Blackburn. So we're about to learn about telomeres. Here we go. Well, Dr. Eppel, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm so happy to, to be here and talk with you, David, at this very exciting time in human history and human uh, health and having a body. <laughs> yeah, well, it's something that most of us uh, are, are grateful for. Um, we're going to jump right into the book, The Telomere Effect. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about telomeres. You go to a conference and there's a supplement that's going to increase telomerase or your telomere length or who knows what. But if you can, let's just take some steps back and, and explain what telomeres are and why they're important. And then we'll talk about if it's indeed important, what we might do to preserve them. So telomeres are a fundamental part of our cells. They protect the DNA of every cell in our body. And they are actually made of DNA, but they're not coding genes. They're more like sensors and they sense when there's stress around and, and biochemical stress in the cell and they send out signals. And so they're basically a, in a sense, they are a canary in a coal mine. And if there's too much stress around, they're going to tell that cell to uh, pretty much arrest, to stop its uh, programming to either die, apoptosis, or to become senescent, which means that the cell no longer can divide that the cell is actually becomes old and can become pro-inflammatory. So the, the level of stress in our cells is very important to, uh, to monitor and regulate because our telomeres are, are listening and sensing that. Now they are repeat, um, they are protecting our DNA both from, from damage, from breaks, but they also serve another function. The longer our telomeres are, the longer our cells can go on dividing, replenishing, 
and creating new cells that can keep our our brain and our cardiovascular system healthy for decades till our 10th decade, for example. So we know centenarians tend to have longer telomeres. And so they're really, a, you know, in a sense, one of the crude clocks in the cell that determine how long that cell can go on and be healthy and continue dividing. So at the ends of our DNAs, we have these, uh, as you mentioned, non-coding segments. In other words, they're not involved, ultimately being transcribed to form proteins. And they are sensors of the stress of that cell and influence that cell's ability to replicate, which uh, is really very important that we replenish cells throughout the body, even in the brain. And that when that replication is compromised, and I think your thesis is that because of shortened telomeres, that is according, as you mentioned in your book, this notion of replicative senescence. In other words, we've reached a part where we cannot provide new cells because our telomeres have been uh, have undergone attrition, they're shorter. So it seems like therefore we should do what we can to maintain healthy telomer, telomeres uh, because you've also described how shortened telomeres seem to relate to various disease processes, pr uh, predict uh, risk of diabetes in twins, uh, risk of Alzheimer's by looking simply at white blood cell telomere length. So why should we then, I mean, if you can amplify a little bit about the notion that our choices affect telomeres in terms of their, their structural viability, their length, if you will, and maybe talk about the, uh, just as a, as a graphic, mental graphic, this aglet thing at the end of the shoelace. And we'll continue to go back to that as we talk. Yes, the, the shoelace metaphor is great. Um, my, my colleague and partner in, in crime and studying telomeres over the last 15 years is Elizabeth Blackburn, who is uh, a, a cell biologist who, with her colleagues, uh, received the, the Nobel Prize for discovering the enzyme telomerase that protects telomeres and the genetic code for telomeres. And she likes to describe the telomeres as the plastic tips at the end of our shoelaces, because those are protect, they're made of mostly the same material, they're protective, and when that tip wears down with use, it can fray. And so in a sense, we want to think of, you know, protecting the, the tips of our chromosomes and, and preventing wear and tear and promoting restoration and rebuilding. We know that actually we can rebuild these tips when we are doing things that are restorative and healthful, we, in a sense, boost the enzyme that rebuilds the telomere, the telomerase enzyme. So um, there are some genetic uh, uh, variances that people have in th some of the genes that are involved in making telomerase and therefore would have an implication as, uh, in terms of the length of telomeres like TERT, for example. What do we know about people with uh, genetic variations of these uh, various uh, gene pathways? This is a great question because often people say, you know, I heard that, um, that telomeres are just a marker and not a mechanism. And they're both. And, and partly we know that they cause premature aging when they get too short is through these, um, the example of these genetic disorders. So some people are born with uh, very uh, different telomerase enzymes and they only make around half, 50% of the normal amount of telomerase. And what happens is that certain tissues actually re uh, reach that replicative senescence early. They, they, can, they age early and these people die early, usually in their 50s or so. So one of the tissues that gets affected is the lungs. The lungs are fat, you know, fast dividing uh, cells. And so pulmonary fibrosis is one of the common disorders that happens when you don't have enough telomerase. So these genes that code for, sh for low telomerase or short telomeres cause an early aging syndrome. And that, that's one of the proofs of concept how important telomerase is. But another one is, the common genes that we all have for telomerase 
are there's some variance in it. And some people are on the high end and they they create a, a lot of telomerase and some of us are on the low end. And if we have the genes for lower levels of telomerase, we're more likely to die of Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease. If we have the genes for super telomerase, we actually are more at risk of cancer. So just like um, this kind of Goldilocks principle, there, there really is a sweet spot. We want to have long, stable telomeres, but we don't want like super powered, you know, genetically long telomeres, because that does mean our tissue will be replicating for longer. And that means that our cancerous cells uh, may be, you know, amplified and divide even faster. And uh, it brings up an interesting point because, you know, throughout the book, which uh, I told you I've, re I've read three times because it was so good. Um, you talk about the role of stress, uh, uh, caregiving people, especially mothers of children, et cetera, and plotting the length of their telomeres versus the amount of stress that they uh, experience and how stress is such a powerful effect in terms of being related to shorter telomeres. So one would gain the, the sense uh, throughout the book that overall we, we would have, we'd be better off if our telomeres remain longer based upon all of the studies that you're talking about relating to consequences of shorter telomeres. But the part of that uh, discussion that's uh, challenging is the notion that um, longer telomeres are associated with certain types of brain tumor like glioblastoma multiforme, um, uh, melanoma, for example. And so, um, you know, how do you reach that sweet spot? And is that sweet spot, uh, should that be part of a personalized medicine approach for the individual, how do you know when you've done everything you can and you shouldn't do any more in terms of amplifying your telomerase so that you have stable or perhaps you can increase the length of your telomeres? This is a good question. Given the complexity that ultra long telomeres, particularly telomeres that are long because of the genetic profile are put us at risk of cancer, a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to do all, all these things that will lengthen my telomeres. And what I like to say is there is no evidence that any of the healthy lifestyle things that we can do to maintain stable long telomeres cause cancer. In fact, it's completely the opposite. So um, lifestyle long is what we want. We want, our, uh, we want to do the different behaviors that we know keep our telomeres happy. And not worry about lengthening them too much so that it would promote cancer because that's actually, uh, we probably can't. We probably can't boost our telomerase into the level that puts us at risk of cancer. That's a very, that's a great uh, answer because what, what you just said, if I'm correct, is that all the lifestyle things that you talk about, reducing stress, which is a central theme throughout the book, but also you mentioned uh, aerobic exercise, you mentioned high intensity interval training, you mentioned a dietary, uh, issues, uh, avoidance of toxins. You got into the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio discussion, which I thought was great. Maybe we can go there in just a moment because our viewers are really kind of keen on that. But those are about what we should do, not as if there were some sort of pharmaceutical intervention available to us today, because I don't know that there is, that would necessarily increase the length of our telomeres or, or by default, uh, prior to that, amplify our telomerase values. So that I guess if people knew based on their uh, genetic profiling, looking at their SNPs and gene variations, if they had, uh, let's say, variation of TERT uh, or knew their length of their telomeres, that by and large, still the lifestyle choices are the way to go. Exactly. I think, you know, what I recommend to people, well, I mean, I got my telomeres measured by 23andMe and one SNP, you know, one of the genes says I'm short, one of them says I'm long. It's really not sensical for an individual to be interpreting those. The only time that we suggest the genotyping and the careful telomere measurement is for people who do have some reason to believe that they have a telomere disorder, you know, family history or early signs of pulmonary fibrosis. Then, then we need to know the cause. For most of us, we know what to do to promote stable telomeres, and we should be doing, uh, you know, it really does come down to the um, how you wake up and what you do each day and whether the balance is toward 
break down, you know, catabolism versus restoration and building up and cleaning out our cells. So it's that kind of daily balance that we should focus on. And I don't, you know, recommend that people measure their telomeres. And if they do, just don't take it that seriously. Because if you have real, if you have long telomeres and then you measure them again in, uh, you know, a few months or a year later, you will shorten uh, more than at the average person because you can. It's a homeostatic system and short telomeres are more stable and don't shorten as much. Long telomeres shorten more. So it's a tricky thing to try to monitor in oneself. But we, but we do know that uh, you know people are tend to have shorter telomeres if they've had a lot of early life adversity, and so rather than finding out your length at this moment, embracing what you can do because telomeres can change on a daily or hourly basis, and so embracing what we do to promote that stability is really the healthy focus. Do you think it's reasonable to consider telomere length as a marker of aging? Well, it's, it's as you said, um, one specific marker of one type of aging, replicative senescence. This gets to be very important for certain disorders. So what, we're, what we know most about is we measure the immune cells and, we, and the length of the telomeres and the immune cells. It does give us a glimpse into the telomeres and the rest of our body. We, they all come from the same kind of uh, progenitor cells and stem cells. And, and what we know is that shorter telomeres in an adult predict earlier diseases and earlier mortality in a very loose statistical way. So it is a marker of aging with a small effect, but it also has implications for our, our, the health of our immune system. So we know from, uh, studies of infections that if you have short telomeres and you might be a young, healthy adult, you're more likely to get colds. And this was uh, in one case, an experiment my colleague Sheldon Cohen did where he infected people with a cold virus. And those with short telomeres, particularly CD8 telomeres, this particular cell that's important for um, aging, it ages early. Uh, People with shorter telomeres in their immune cells we're much more likely to get infected and to have symptoms and to use more tissues. And we also know that short telomeres predict a better antibody response to the flu vaccine. So in the short run, as a young, healthy person, your telomeres are still influencing your health, at least your immune health, which is is also a predictor of your long-term health and aging. Well, this takes us to a, an interesting topic, isn't it? That um, there may be then a relationship between a telomere length uh, and our ability to mount an appropriate immune response in uh, response to a vaccination, for example. So I, I think if I can read into your words that having uh, more robust telomeres might uh, influence the uh, response of our uh, CD8 cells uh, and ultimately our ability to mount an appropriate immune response and memory as it relates to getting an immunization. Exactly, David. And so you can imagine that me and other researchers interested in telomeres are looking very closely at what's happening with COVID. And we know that people infected with COVID, if they have shorter telomeres, they develop a more sev- a greater severity and they also have lower levels of T cells. What we need when we get infected is a, pr- a massive proliferation of our T cells. And that will help uh, with our antibody response and clearing the virus. But if you have short telomeres, those T cells can't clonally expand as much and as fast. And so you run out of these immune cells and you cannot fight and clear the virus as much. So that's what we think is happening. We are launching a huge vaccination study um, this month. Uh, NIH has funded this as a priority to really understand the role of telomeres in uh, vaccination response. It's almost like we have this immune system. We don't know how strong it is. It's kind of a hidden silent variable, but the vaccination reveals how robust is your immune system. If you have long telomeres, you... Uh, we predict you're going to mount a huge antibody response as, you know, what we call this kind of seroconversion 
to um, developing a fourfold response in your increase in, in COVID antibodies. And we already know that older people develop a lower antibody response. About 50% of them develop a good response to the flu vaccine. And so this is a very important issue, particularly for older people to understand how to promote a better antibody response. There are things that we can also do to promote a better antibody response on a daily basis. So we, we can talk about that if you'd like. Well, I think that our viewers, uh, uh, if uh, looking back at the interview we did uh, several weeks ago with Dr. David Sinclair, uh, are, are really, I think, probably hopefully up to speed with the discussion that we had with reference to the role of NAD in uh, immune activation, immune competence, and really offsetting the senescence that you're describing. So having uh, precursors to NAD on board or uh, you know, in, engaging in exercise, et cetera, various things that we can do to amplify our immune response. But I think it brings up a very good point. And so many of our um, discussions these days end up about COVID, but you know, it's top of mind for everybody. And, and, and that said, when we look at an immunization as uh, having a build, um, effectiveness of 95%, whatever effectiveness means. Does it mean uh, a 95% reduced risk of severe or moderate uh, response to being infected? Whatever the, the uh, definition is. I think you brought up an interesting point that uh, it, you know, being age dependent, that, that doesn't mean 95% in all comers. It means that's the average we're going to get that uh, you know, a healthy 35-year-old uh, frontline healthcare worker may get a 98 or 99, whereas older people might get uh, somewhere in the upper 80s, whatever, and it, that's sort of the average. But, uh, you know, we can improve our odds. And I think that um, if indeed uh, telomeres relate to functional capacity by virtue of a, reducing the risk of immune cell senescence that you're describing, and therefore that inflammatory cascade that feeds back to further shortened telomeres, as you had a wonderful diagram that demonstrated, that it really speaks back to us in terms of focusing not on our chronological age, which is where the cutoffs are for the vaccine, but more our biological age, which is clearly a manifestation of the choices that we make each and every day that you wonderfully described in your book about what is our mood, uh, how, how do we confront uh, stress, um, you know, our, our appetite, our, our, rather our food choices. And uh, even you, you spend a lot of time talking about sleep, which I thought was really very, very helpful as well, that we can therefore influence our chronological age, no, but our biological age, yes. How reactive our immune cells are, and therefore getting back to our topic here, how might we then respond to getting an immunization? It's not just because we're 70 years of age, but what is our telomere length and how does that re reflect upon immune competence? What is our biological age in that regard as well in terms of this replicative senescence that you described? So it's very empowering what you're talking about. Uh, you know, the book is written about uh, telomere length as it relates to diabetes, the twin studies, uh, Alzheimer's, other issues, but let's face it, the thing people are concerned about right now is COVID and the, the relationship of what you're describing in every chapter in your book as it relates to COVID, I think is really very profound. Thank you, David. I think that what people realize when they read the book is that they control their rate of aging in a way they never imagined, that, that these daily you know, lifestyle choices or small nudges are absolutely influencing our cellular environment and our rate of you know, telomere attrition. And so it is, the way I think about it is, what can you do today to you know, change the kind of, change the stress soup to healthy soup, right? So the stress soup is, stress affects all, so many chemical processes. So it's not just stress hormones, but it's oxidative stress, the free radicals, which uh, most definitely damp down on telomeres, inflammation, higher levels of insulin. So that's stress too. How do we shift that to be, um, you know, a more kind of restorative medium with growth factors and lower levels of stress hormones? So everything we do nudges it one way or the other. So getting healthy sleep actually increases the growth hormone, decreases the stress hormones. Uh, 
one night of not getting sleep after an immunization actually dramatically reduces the amount of antibodies you produce. That was at least one study on, on the flu vaccine. And it was because of this shift, because when you got a full night's sleep after vaccination, you have high growth hormone, lower stress hormones. And those who were sleep deprived had the opposite, lower growth hormone, higher stress hormones. So, you know, just asking yourself, what is my balance right now? And, and what do I need to nudge me into a, you know, more restorative or anabolic state? It might be something that is calming. It might be a nap or meditation or listening to music, something that's reducing arousal, but it could equally be something that's increasing arousal in a positive way. And there we, there we come to the hormetic stress idea. I, I want to tell you that, that uh, as, as it relates to that, uh, I really gravitated to uh, the part of the book where you were discussing um, the difference between uh, being in the now versus uh, concentrating on the future or the past, being uh, a person who's involved in multitasking as opposed to unitasking, and the, the study of uh, following children into adulthood, or, or I think, I guess it retrospectively rated them on conscientiousness and how that as a personality trait related to longer telomeres, and which might relate to longevity as per the, uh, the 100,000 uh, people study in terms of all-cause mortality from, I forget the organization, uh, from the uh, institution, but nonetheless how Focusing on only yourself as opposed to the, the bigger picture and the future picture and other people being part of something. I think you called it uh, eudaimonic happiness, where you're part of, of a plan for bigger and better for everybody. It, it's, these are themes that we, talk, that we talked about in, in Brainwash, that it's distancing from the amygdala, self-centered, fear, stress, cortisol area to the prefrontal cortex uh, which is about, yes, about yourself, but about others, about planning for the future and taking a step back and not being uh, so focused about right now and the fear that of everything going on around us. So I, it was a, it was, I was really deeply into it there, knowing what we've, we've been talking about lately about this differentiation between, between amygdala-centric, if there is such a word, activity and, and mental processes versus those that amplify prefrontal cortex and allow us to take a deep breath and look at the bigger picture. These are some of the most important concepts and neuroscience underlying longe healthy longevity. And we, particularly here in Silicon Valley, are so focused on what pill can I take? What's the biohack? We forget that the biggest source of well being comes from actually momentary well being, being present and engaged and connected to other people and connected to purpose and meaning. So, those are things that you know, you've written about and tied to health so beautifully in Brainwash. And I love it that you wrote it with your son. That just is such a, you know, a beautiful generational um, contribution you guys have made. So this idea of disconnecting from this reactive, you know, amygdala driven state that we so often live in is really important. And part of it comes down to, I'll just say momentary health is actually being, realizing that when we can actually sit back and be present and take a breath, a full breath, a full breath in and a full exhalation out, we are sending our body powerful signals that we are safe. So our default is that we're not safe. There, in, in so many ways, that's the healthy evolutionary default. And so we need to set, use signals, send our body signals and send our mind signals that it is time for restoration right now. Right now, everything is okay. We can actually change our breathing rate, change our nervous system balance from less sympathetic to more parasympathetic within minutes. And that is the fundamental building block of balance, daily balance of wellness. And then when you uh, add doing things that are meaningful and, and purposeful, there is a biology to that that I believe we will uh, be uncovering as a field 
that we, we know from, from studies that follow people's lives that if you feel more purpose and if you have positive relationships, these predict healthy longevity. And so we're starting to uncover the biology. And I think NIH has just funded uh, national networks of emotional well-being. We have we'll have one at UCSF too to really understand the biology of eudaimonia and emotional well-being. So it's very exciting. The other thing you touched at in, in your book was that it's not just the stress network. We have biohacked our reward network to be demanding and dependent on the pleasure response, right? So whatever that may be, food, uh, um, not real food, but the <laughs> the um, sugar, high fat sugar loading that just stimulates our reward center, just like a drug does. And also the reward of needing to be validated externally. So the likes on social media is now one way that it, in a very unhealthy way that we're, our pleasure center has been hijacked. So we're dependent on external false rewards rather than real purpose, love and meaning. I was, I was taken by your mention of a meditation practice, Kirtan Kriya, that has uh, been popularized by our good friend Dharma Singh Khalsa uh, in the context, in his context of um, reducing some of the described drivers of Alzheimer's disease pathology. And I'm, I'm certain, you know, we're, we're talking about the same thing here with respect to higher cortisol levels, cortisol being uh, at high levels toxic to the cells of the brain's memory center, the hippocampus as well as inflammation, uh, et cetera, that, um, you know, here's a practice that's been around for thousands of years in meditative practice that really helps uh, a focus in the here and now where, you know, it's, it's almost a chant that, that goes on with, um, you know, satanama, where, where you repeat a certain thing, do some hand movements, uh, and how being in the present, in the now, distancing yourself from planning about the future, worrying about the past, uh, is exceedingly uh, powerful. And now to see you d describe a 43%, I think it was, increased level of telomerase, that enzyme that helps enlarge uh, telomeres or, and or preserve them, um, is, is really, um, it's powerful stuff. I mean, you can't find that in a bottle or on a shelf anywhere. And yet there it is, a meditative practice. And so, you know, it, when we... Uh, for many of us, myself included, there has to be the science that will then validate these ancient practices. We're seeing it day in and day out, whether it's the anti-inflammatory effect of curcumin uh, or who knows what. But when you finally see the science, my gosh, it's so powerful. Let's move if we can, because I was very uh, taken in a very positive way by your discussion. Of, well, a couple things. First, let's talk about the uh, omega-3 versus omega-6. Our viewers are quite familiar with the notion that the omega-6 vegetable oils tend not to be the healthful choice. And you made some very interesting comments about the ratio that we have between omega-6 and omega-3, and then about DHA specifically in relation to telomeres. Right, those, you know, when, of course we wanna take all the supplements that we think are safe and that can help. And so, the om omegas are, as you have covered, are so important on that list. And now we know that they're also one of the superfoods, in a sense, for telomere health. And this is a, uh, this, we find this both from supplementation studies as well as from dietary pattern studies. So when we uh, conducted, when my friend Jan Kiko Glazer conducted the omega trial, it was there were several interesting things that we learned about that. It was the ratio, as you said, of three to six that mattered, not one or the other, but it was also what we can absorb in our cells that mattered. So it wasn't the dose people were taking, but rather the level that they absorbed in their red blood cells. And so this is just a, you know, a note or a point to our individual differences. And if you, you know, you have the the means and ability to, to do testing with supplements that really does help you know the dose you need and calibrate levels. Because the high dose uh, in our study, the high dose omega group did not do better than the low dose. It was really just an individual difference of how much you absorbed. But those who had developed the higher level of 
uh, three to six developed a much better profile. They had lower oxidative stress, higher telomerase, and longer telomeres. So telomere lengthening, everyone wonders, can you really lengthen them? Are they plastic in that way? I think we have enough intervention studies now to show that in the short term, if you're doing an intensive intervention over several months, you can lengthen them. Whether they stay long or not when you stop, of course, is, is the next question. And does that improve longevity is another question. But we, this is a malleable system, this responsive system. So again, when you think about nutrition, it's the, um, again, it's this idea of thinking about how am I controlling the level of stress in my cell? So you want to be eating an antioxidant diet, an anti-inflammatory diet, which is just a fancy way of saying, you know, the whole, whole foods grains, vegetables, eat the rainbow on your plate. These are going to be, these are consistently associated with longer telomeres. In every, in most of the population studies, regardless of what country, it is the Mediterranean diet or the whole food diet that's associated with longer telomeres. The Western diet, the red meat and the high sugar and sodas especially are associated with shorter telomeres. In fact, you described uh, 20 ounces of sodas a day being related to a reduction in telomere length that correlated with, I think it was 4.6 years. So it was something like, it was a pretty remarkable statistic. But let me get back to uh, the, these are correlations uh, that uh, shorter telomeres correspond, correlate with increased risk of diabetes, Alzheimer's, certain forms of cancers. How solid are we now on the mechanistic relationship that, that may be explored, may be described? I mean, are, is the telomere actually playing a role or is it an epiphenomenon? This is a good question. And it is hard in, in humans to, you know, be determining causality. We can see telomere length uh, be responsive to these lifestyle interventions. But it is, we do think of it as also a integrative readout, a reflection of many factors of health. So for example, um, it is a, the more systemic inflammation we have in our blood, the shorter the telomeres. And if we're high in just CR, in one study, if we're high in just CRP, our telomeres are maybe a little bit shorter, but if we're high in IL-6 and CL, uh, CRP, they're a lot shorter. So it's this cumulative additive marker of the health of the kind of you know, on one hand, the level of um, inflammaging, but also other things we study, the, these aging systems are so correlated. So, you know, we focused narrowly on telomeres in our book, but what we wrote about applies to most of the other aging systems like inflammation and the mitochondria. So mitochondria health are associated with telomere health and they talk to each other in the cell. So when the mitochondria gets old and leaky and leaks out reactive oxygen species, the telomeres get shorter. When the telomeres break down, they leak out um, signals to damage the mitochondria. So they're all, all these interconnected systems are different readouts. And I like just to talk about conceptually about cellular aging. What is your rate of cellular aging rather than one marker? The epigenetic clock is another we could talk about. Well, let me um, ask, uh, as it relates to that, uh, there, there's a lot of discussion. I mean, I think the premise of, the, of your book at the beginning was that, um, that telomeres are involved in detecting or responding to a DNA breakage, a one of the fundamental uh, uh, players in, in, in aging. Um, and somehow the telomeres uh, uh, selfishly attract the repair mechanisms of DNA uh, breakage to themselves. Is that, is that a mechanism? Am I understanding that correctly? That, that was what was described? So they, they, do, they do send out signals. And what happens when there is, um, let's say, you know, a burst of oxidative stress that is damaging the telomeres, telomerase enzyme is responsive to oxidative stress. And so it will jump in and increase the levels and rebuild the telomere. So there's a there's a kind of a yin yang system between the telomeres and the telomerase. The telomerase is a is a 
DNA polymerase, but it has this unique action on the telomere to actually rebuild the base pairs. Um, the, there, there's a lot we're learning about telomere science. So we've been talking about how it shortens at, slowly over time and is from, you know contributing to disease in certain ways. But it is also thought that there can be DNA damage when you have sh long telomeres too. And that telomerase is still important there and it comes in and it heals um, and prevents the DNA damage. And so the, you know, this, is, um, this is new work that is uh, coming out uh, by colleagues of ours that is suggesting there's many things happening with telomerase. It's a very salutary enzyme in ways that are independent of the telomere length. I mean, I don't I mean to throw you a curveball, and if it is a curveball, I apologize. But there, uh, it, there's a thought that um, some of the uh, you know interventions for stress these days, and depression, and anxiety, and PTSD, there's a lot of uh, attention to things like psilocybin uh, and uh, similar types of molecules. What would you speculate might the relationship be, let's say, between psilocybin use and and telomere length? You're not the first to ask that, David. I, I think we um, we are now in the era of psilocybin research, and it's very exciting. And one of the uh, one of the states that psilocybin leads to is a decoupling from the self. And you can we like to say you can get there through a decade of meditation <laughs> and developing new habits about the self or you can get there through a session of psilocybin, which takes that neural network of self offline immediately. Um, so there's some similarities, but you know, different, different pathways and timelines. Um, the interesting, uh, so we don't know about psilocybin and long-term health. We do know about mental health, that it's clearly creating large shifts in uh, habits of thinking and other ways of thinking about the world that are, that are, really looking quite, you know, phenomenally healing with PTSD and depression. So that's exciting in itself. There is no physical health without mental health. So clearly it's going to have longer term implications with longer term effects. In terms of the, you know, the states that it's promoting, I would, I believe that we can reach those states with other ways. It's just more work. Um, I, I did hear your discussion with the Wim Hof method, you know, that uh, with Wim Hof, who's wonderful, and you know, we're studying his method too. And I, I know, was just going to ask you about that because I think in my interview, he, he, uh, he said he was going to work uh, to explore telomere length, and I think he might have mentioned your name. So, so that's great. So, you are moving ahead with that? Right. So, he men mentions UCSF um, and doesn't mention my name because he knows that we're keeping a blinded study okay. and people are in the set enrolled in the study, not knowing what they're going to get. They, they may get a meditative breathing or a pace breathing, or they may get the Wim Hof breathing. But if we call it Wim Hof breathing, um, there is such a phenomenal story of personal transformation anecdotes that we, that would bias our study. So, um, yeah. but we've, uh, finished data collection now for now, so we can talk about it and we don't know the results yet, but I can tell you that it so is it's really just his breathing technique because I can't imagine you can double blind going on, into an ice bath. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, and we compare that to the hot, sh you know, to warmer showers. That was a control group. So the, uh, you know, the hypoxic state, the, the state that people describe after the breathing in this kind of placid state when your maybe your stress resilience um, tolerance is very high is uh, is also a you know let's just say a strong chemically induced state and we're studying that we're studying mood right afterward um, it looks quite positive as you might experience I know you've tried this method the you know there are other ways to induce this state with different ways that we dramatically change our physiology. There is a group studying orgasmic meditation, which I um, we can't go into, but I can say that they think it's like psilocybin. They think there's com commonalities with also a meditative state um, when there is a uh, loss of the kind of um, self-centered, self-referential thinking. 
Yeah. Well, you know, it, I am, am all in for being supportive of the new of the research that's now less stigmatized and uh, having the ability to move forward because, you know, we are early, but we're seeing some really pretty profound data come out uh, in terms of things like, P you know, life crippling issues like PTSD and a major depressive disorder. So it's, it's really great that there's finally a crack in the ice, no Wim Hof reference uh, indicated there, but anyway, but um, you did a, you did a great job on this book and I, I want to thank you for joining us on the program today. And it sounds like you've got a lot of uh, pretty exciting things moving forward that you're uh, looking at. Thank you. I'm excited to share the results of our Wim Hof study and our COVID stress telomere study when we have them. <laughs> well, I hope you do. I hope you can get that to us and we can get you back on and we can get an update. So thank I'd you I'd love for that. to. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your great work, David. My pleasure. And thanks for being with us today. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, what an interesting discussion that was. Uh, we learned about these relationships, and that's very important, of telomere length and of the amount of this telomerase uh, enzyme, the relationships uh, with things like uh, coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease, uh, cognitive decline, as we see in Alzheimer's disease, and an interesting relationship with various forms of cancers, uh, sometimes uh, telomere length uh, associated with an increased risk of certain cancers and other cancers with whom a decreased telomere length is associated. Very interesting information. Here again is the book, The Telomere Effect. The bottom line is at the end of the day, it's telling us that our lifestyle choices in terms of the food we eat, uh, how we eat, the mindfulness of our eating process, how much sleep we get, and certainly as Dr. Eppel made so very clear today, how we allow or don't allow stress to influence us moment to moment and day by day, how these are all really important controllable factors as they relate to our health and our longevity. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and we will be back soon.